Welcome to the second part of the Attention and Transformers chapter, the Transformers. So, of course, no talk on Transformers is complete without the mandatory picture of something that's utterly unrelated to the Deep Learning Transformers. Um, I think this would be a little bit more apt, namely convolutions versus these, these Decepticons. So what am I getting on here? Well, if you think about convolutions, they are nice and parallel, and you can essentially operate on a large amount of data in parallel with many, many operations being carried out. So this is great if you have many processing units and you don't need that many layers. I mean, you can have tens to maybe a hundred of them, but that kind of takes care of things. Now compare that to recurrent neural networks. If I have a sequence, then well, by its very nature, the sequence is sequential, and it's not uncommon to have tens to hundreds of thousands of characters in a text sequence. Now, since they are all sequential, processing it can take a very long time, and my poor GPU is going to sit pretty much idle for a lot of the time, or at least it's not going to be that advantageous compared to, for instance, a CPU. As after all, I need to, you know, take an observation explanation and, you know, generate the corresponding hidden state, maybe then do that in a deep manner so I can get some degree of parallelization out of it, but not a lot. <clears throat> so how can we fix this? And the problem is essentially that applying convolutions to text sequences doesn't really work that well because, well, the sequences are of variable width and so on, and a lot of the padding and so on operations don't quite make that much sense. On top of that, it's very computationally expensive. So enter transformers. And the key innovation there was something called self-attention. In other words, where you're using the state itself to decide what, which other related states from your neighbors to attend to. So in other words, I'm using the state for a word, like for instance, bank, to decide that I should be probably attending to certain words in the neighborhood to infer the, the meaning of bank, right? Because a bank, bank can be a bench that I sit on. It can be, of course, a river bank. It can be a place where I take the money to and a train can, or a plane can be banking, right? And this isn't totally made up. There's, for instance, the Three Rivers Bank. And the Three Rivers Bank is like a bank that you deposit your money into, and I hope it won't flow away. But in any case, so <clears throat> these things are easily addressable with self-attention where you can use the context and what you know about a token so far to determine what else to look at. Now, usually the attention mechanism doesn't have any specific position information. And since text is sequential, well, we need to bring this back. And one easy way to do that is by just adding a Fourier basis where you just use sine and cosine features to get an idea of where you are within a sequence, at least relative to each other and then further improvements then actually had the same thing to allow you to deal with a counter over, well, sentences, and maybe you could do that for paragraphs and so on, but basically this allows you to get this longer range information. One of the key points though is that in doing this, you can actually perform all those operations in parallel. So the sequential nature happens through a larger aperture where you can look a couple of tokens into the past and into the future and you do that for every word and now you do this repeatedly let's say for each token my aperture is maybe 10 tokens to the left or to the right so after five layers i end up with a range of up to 50 into the past and 50 into the future so this is why i can get good recurrent-like information without actually having to encode recurrence. Okay, now to 
look at that in a little bit more detail. Here's a comparison of what happens if I want to convert a sequence to sequence with attention model into a transformer model, for instance, for machine translation. So I start off with an embedding as I would. I add a positional embedding because, well, that allows me to deal with the fact that the tension per se doesn't really have any notion of order. And now I have this attention mechanism of self-attention where I basically use that to update my next state. The key difference though is that it's actually using a multi-head attention. So this is one of the key points that um, is novel besides the position encoding, namely that you can have multiple attentions. It's like having a database with multiple queries, which gives me multiple answers. In any case, so you get that, you get an output state, you then perform, you, you add a residual connection from the input to the output as you would. You then add, you know, a feed forward network similar to a one by one convolution and you add things again. So this gives me the encoding. For the decoding, you essentially perform the same thing. So in short, what we have is we have a transformer block, which can be repeated multiple times, where <clears throat> you're basically just transforming tokens as you would. And the good thing is, since transformers are quite popular, this has been heavily optimized for essentially every piece of hardware that you might lay your hands on. And then this state is fed into the corresponding decoders, which are also modeled after transformers. And the only difference is that I have two multi-head attention layers rather than one, one which is just a generic one, which incorporates all the state from the encoder, okay? And then you decode. So basically I'm passing the corresponding information to every block and then sequentially you decode things again. So this is exactly what we have before. Um, and this gives me really good encoding, transformation and decoding mechanisms, for instance, for machine translation. So the key difference is that is really in the encoding for the translation. Obviously, I still need to generate, you know, one word at a time, which isn't too crazy if you think about it, that people also just produce one word at a time. People have tried to translate in parallel by iterative refinement and so on, and there's some progress on that, but the results aren't sufficiently convincing that anybody would want to throw away their sequential decoder. <clears throat> a lot of it has to do with making sure that things are consistent. So for instance, if I infer that, you know, the gender of, let's say a cat, then, uh, well, later on referring to that cat again would be, would be good if I had that gender or in German, well, everything has a gender. So, um, you would therefore also want to make sure that things match appropriately, that tenses match, that, you know, counts match. All those things are a lot easier if I do them sequentially. Anyway, nonetheless, for the encoding part, you can basically use good positional encoding with multi-head attention. So the self-attention strategy works really well. So it's multi-head and self-attention, which gives you a new state. And then you're basically transforming a bunch of vectors as it flows through that architecture. Okay. Um, so in a little bit more math. I have, you know, the query weights, the um, key weights and the value weights, um, because since now all three are the same, well, I need to transform them appropriately. Then I perform an appropriate, you know, attention mechanism operation between, you know, the query, the keys and the values. Um, and I can, for instance, use a dot product or the tang attention that we discussed before. And that's it. A um, few more things. Um, the position wise encoding, this is exactly, you know, what we do um, for the Fourier basis. And then afterwards, in order to get a little bit more nonlinearity at every step, we use a 
multi-layer perceptron for each token feature. So if you recall the one-by-one -one convolutions um, for images over all the channels, this does the same thing, except that rather than a pixel, we now have individual words. The last thing that's used in order to increase stability and accuracy a little bit is you use something called the layer norm. So if you recall the batch norm from before, there we normalized over a mini batch, over all the activations within a mini batch, but you did that separately for you know the coordinates of a vector. Here, essentially, you're restricting the length of a vector back to unit length <clears throat> and mean, zero mean. So this means you're effectively projecting things back to a unit ball, and that increases some stability. It's a nice hack. You can use it for a couple of things. Amongst other things, as said, transformers. Um, that really improves accuracy again a little bit. Um, yeah, it's reasonably effective. Uh, positional encoding, I already mentioned this, and that's really all we need. Now, for prediction, <clears throat> key point is you go and, you know, take the inputs of the previous times as keys and values. You also take, you know, the outputs that you've generated so far, and then you're using what where you are right now with your state as the query to predict the next output. Okay. In doing so, you get a mechanism that is, while not entirely parallel, because you still have a sequential decoding process, but at least for the encoder, you have something that works reasonably well. And yeah, by now, basically all meaningful sequence models have switched to transformers sooner or later because they work really well. Okay. So with that, I conclude my very, very, very brief overview of a transformers. <clears throat> so because it's a crash course, so RNNs are inherently sequential. Transformers allow you to get something a little bit more parallel by <clears throat> breaking this process up into parallel operations, similar to what's going on with convolutions. Self-attention allows you to iterate over a sequence easily because while you're encoding, you don't necessarily have any other signal there. <clears throat> then position encoding, the free basis helps you with that if you're using it for deep learning, so deep networks on sets, then, well, you don't need that. If you're using it on graphs, then well, you may want to use the graph structure for some of the position encoding. So there are lots of flavors where you can use the transformer-like approach. So therefore, there are set transformers, there are graph transformers, and basically for any other data structure, you can probably define your own. Um, many of the tricks that people have used in general, like one-by-one -one convolutions, layer norms, residual connections, just carry over and are used. And so it's really this entire package of tricks that gets you good performance with transformers. There's a lot more there. So if you look at multi-head attention, self-attention, positional encoding and transformers, it will allow you to get good results. Okay, with that, we're done with the transformer overview.